It is Monday, uh, 8 a.m. on May 13, 2019, and this hearing will come to order. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karen, uh, Commander Karen Denny, United States Coast Guard, and I'm the Executive Officer at Coast Guard Marine Safety Unit, Portland, Oregon. I'm the Lead Investigating Officer for the 13th Coast Guard District's formal investigation into the events leading to the loss of the mission vessel Mary B2 and the loss of three lives, and I'm the presiding officer over these proceedings. The commander of the 13th Coast Guard District, Rear Admiral Troop, has convened this investigation under the authority of Title 46, United States Code, Section 6301, and Title 46, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 4, to investigate the circumstances surrounding the sinking of the fishing vessel Mary B2 with the loss of three lives on January 8, 2019 while attempting to cross the Buena Bay Bar and enter the port of Newport, Oregon during the hours of darkness. We will conduct the investigation under the rules of Title 46, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 4. Other than myself, the members of this formal investigation include Lieutenant Teresa Bagai, Assistant Investigating Officer, and Lieutenant Commander Michelle Foster, Technical Advisor. The legal counsel for this board is Lieutenant Colin Fogarty. The recorder is Lieutenant Luke Woods. Upon completion of the investigation, this formal investigation will submit its reports of findings, conclusions, and recommendations to the commander, 13th Coast Guard District. I would like to request the cooperation of all persons present to minimize any disruptive influence on the proceedings in general and on the witnesses in particular. Witnesses are appearing before the investigation to provide valuable information that will assist this investigation. We request that all members of the public be courteous to the witnesses and respect their right to privacy. I ask that you silence all cell phones at this time and please exit the hearing room to make or receive phone calls. With the exception of one pool camera, photography, including television cameras, will only be permitted during this opening statement and during recess periods. The members of the press are welcome and an area has been set aside uh, for their use during these proceedings. The news media may question witnesses concerning testimony they have given after I have released them from these proceedings. I ask that any such interviews be conclude, uh, conducted outside of this room. The investigation will determine as closely as possible the factors that contributed to the, uh, to the incident so that proper recommendations for the prevention of similar casualties may be made whether there is evidence of any act of misconduct, inattention to duty, negligence, or willful violation of law on the part of any licensed or certificated individual that may have contributed to the casualty, and whether there is evidence that any Coast Guard personnel or any representative or employee of any other government agency or any other person caused or contributed to the casualty. This hearing will focus on the circumstances surrounding the loss of the commercial fishing vessel Mary B2 and the three crew members. The hearing will explore the regulatory requirements for a vessel such as the Mary B2, the material condition of the Mary B2, human factors such as crew experience, fatigue, impairment, decision making, and bridge resource management. We will examine the condition of the waterway and the Coast Guard's activities related to the accident such as aids navigation, and regulated navigation areas. The Coast Guard has designated parties and in interest in this investigation. In Coast Guard Marine Casualty Investigations, a party in interest is an individual, organization, or other entity that under existing evidence or because of his or her position may be responsible for or contributed uh, to the casualty. The, per the party in interest may also be an individual, organization, or other entity having a direct interest in the investigation and demonstrating the potential for contributing significantly to the completeness of the investigation, or otherwise enhancing the safety of life and property at sea through participation as a party in interest. All parties in interest have a statutory right to employ counsel to represent them, to cross-examine witnesses, and to have witnesses called on their behalf. Witnesses who are not designated as party in interest May, may be assisted by counsel for the purpose of advising them. However, such counsel are not permitted to examine or cross-examine other witnesses or otherwise participate in this investigation. I will now read uh, the names of the parties in interest whom I pre 
previously designated as a parking assist. I have designated the Mary B2 LLC owner of the Mary B2 as a party in interest. Mr. Fitz Riley is the legal counsel for Mary B2 LLC, and I ask that, that counsel announce their appearance on behalf of their client. Mr. Riley? Thank you, Jenna. I'm Chris Riley with the Lynch Blackman Clients here on behalf of Tishita and Mary B2 LLC. Party in interest. Thank you. The formal investigation will place all witnesses under oath. When testifying under oath, a witness is subject to the federal laws and penalties for perjury and making false statements under Title 18 United States Code Section 1001. Penalties include a fine up to $250,000 or imprisonment up to five years or both. The sources of information into which this investigation will inquire are many and varied. Since the date of the casualty, the Coast Guard has conducted substantial evidence collection activities, and some of that previously collected evidence will be considered during these proceedings. The Coast Guard has compiled a list of 62 exhibits of various types, and a list of the exhibits along with the title and type of exhibit will be posted publicly after being compiled at the conclusion of this hearing. Should any person have or believe that he or she has information not brought forth, but which might be of direct significance, that person is urged to bring that information to my attention by emailing accidentinfo at uscg.mil. During the hearing, you may also email the investigation directly at maryb2.uscg at gmail.com. And this email address will be monitored continuously for any comments during the hearing. The hearing will also be live streamed on livestream.com backslash uscg investigations for that stream. The member of the Coast Guard investigation, the members of the Coast Guard investigation team will now take the oath. The recorder, Lieutenant Woods, has previously been sworn in. Do you state your names? Swear that you will faithfully perform all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of this formal investigation, and that you will examine and inquire into the matter now before you without partiality or healthy doubt. I do. Thank you. This concludes the opening statement. At this time, I'd like to ask for everyone present to stand for a moment of silence in respect to those persons who have been lost at sea as a result of this casualty. Thank you. Please be seated. We will now call our first witness of this day. Or actually, away my last. We're going to do an overview presentation.
Yeah, so vessel particulars for the fishing vessel married to are above. The official number was 27604, and the vessel was registered in the United States as a commercial fishing vessel, displacement hold for near coastal fishery. This 23 gross ton, 15 net ton vessel was built in 1957. The principal dimensions of the vessel were 41 feet 7 inches in length, with a beam or width of 13.4 feet and a depth of 7.1 feet. The draft could vary due to loading up of fuel, catch, water, or other variables. The vessel was of wood construction, while the top sides were fiberglass over wood. The vessel was propelled by a single 32-inch five-bladed propeller, and the engine was a single engine of approximately 160 horsepower. The vessel had two fuel tanks, each with a 200-gallon capacity. Next. There were three persons aboard at the time of the accident, the captain or operator, and two crew persons. Next. Post-mortem toxicology tests were conducted and the results were as follows. Captain Steve Gernacki, alcohol, uh, ethanol, 0.033 grams per deciliter with no acetone detected. There was methamphetamine, methamphetamine detected at 0.17 milligrams per liter, I'm sorry, amphetamine, and methamphetamine at 0.50 milligrams per liter. Crew member James Lacey had neither alcohol in ethanol or acetone detected, but cannabinoids were detected. And for crew member Josh Porter, there was neither alcohol in ethanol or acetone detected, nor uh, did the toxin toxicological examination show any presence of controlled substances, substances or other common pharmaceuticals. Next slide. The weather from the bar condition report was at 8.58 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on January 8, 2019, indicated that the swells near the Uquina Bay Bar jetty tips were 12 to 14 feet with occasional 16-foot swells. With visibility of six nautical miles and winds east-southeast at 10 to 13 knots, the bar was restricted to all recreational and uninspected passenger vessels. Next slide. These vessels pictured on the slide were operating offshore from the entrance of the Aquina Bay Bar and returned to port before the fishing vessel Mary B2 began its transit under the Coast Guard escort. Next slide. This slide contains examples of tools that the Coast Guard uses to warn mariners about the unique conditions of the Aquina Bay Bar. This includes signage, warning signals, and other safety information in printed form. Next slide. This slide displays the Coast Guard's vessels and aircraft that participated in the escort and eventual search and rescue activities on the late afternoon and evening of January 8, 2019. They include a 52-foot motor lifeboat called the Victory and a 47-foot motor lifeboat with a hull number 47266 and the Coast Guard helicopter designated as the HH-65 Dolphin. Next slide. This is a portion of the nautical chart, 18581, showing the location of the accident, which is circled, and the location of the waterway on an insert, uh, on an inset map of the United States in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. Next slide. A, fur a further look at the portions of nautical uh, chart 18581, showing the channel and jetties at Uquina Bay Bar and the approximate positions of the Coast Guard Victory and the Coast Guard 47266, as well as a spotter, uh, which is CG Mobile One, evaluating park conditions and providing information to the Coast Guard team. Okay. 
fine. This slide shows the details of the location of the vessel wreckage and a photo of the right side, on the right side of the slide, showing the cabin and some decking from the vessel on the beach the morning of January 9th, 2019. Next slide. At this time, at this time, we're gonna make uh, this exhibit, exhibit Coast Guard 001, available to the media and we're going to put it up on the newsroom and at this time we're going to take a five minute recess it is 0 8 15 uh, for the record and we're taking a five minute recess please be back at 8 20.
It is 8.20 a.m. and we are going back on record. Um, we'll go ahead and hear from our first witness <coughs> and we'll now hear testimony from Mr. Clint Thunderbird, the previous owner of the Mary D2. Uh, Mr. Thunderbird, please come forward and to the witness table and uh, Lieutenant Woods will administer your oath and ask you some preliminary questions. A false statement given to an agency of the United States is punishable by fine and or imprisonment under 18 U.S.C. 1001. Knowing this, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Please be seated. Please state and spell your full name. Clinton uh, Robert Thunderbird. Mr. Funderburg, sorry, I know it's a little like awkward, but uh, your mic, I think it's right now set to maybe push to talk. So for the benefit of everybody else, um, actually, we have somebody set it uh, to help them so that it's just hot mic. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, please continue. Please state your current employment and position. Uh, commercial fisherman, owner of fish and vessels. Can you state any education or training related to your profession? Uh, none. Do you have any professional licenses or certificates related to your profession? Uh, no. At this time, Lieutenant Bagai will begin her line of questioning. Good morning, Mr. Fondro. Thank you for appearing today at this hearing. If you need to take a break at any moment, please let me know. All of my questions are going to be regarding the period of time before the accident, unless I specifically state otherwise. In front of you, there is a laser pointer. In case you need uh, to point at an exhibit uh, to answer a question today. If and when you do that, um, for the benefit of the public, I would ask you to point uh, at this screen directly behind me. Right now, I would like to follow up on some of the questions that Lieutenant Woods asked. How long have you been fishing in a commercial capacity? Uh, 34 years. Can you describe your experience operating commercial fishing vessels um, in, in terms of how long um, and what type of fisheries? Uh, multiple fisheries all around the Pacific, North and South. I, from around here, started fishing here around age 12. And uh, I fished my whole life, yeah, extensive experience up and down the West Coast and Pacific Islands and all the countries around the Pacific Rim. This one, those fisheries include the Dungeness crab fish? It does. How long have you worked out of the Yaquina Bay area in Newport? Uh, on and off for the 34 years. And you mentioned earlier you do not have a merchant's minor credential, is that correct? Correct. Is that a requirement for the type of commercial fishing vessel operations that you're involved with? No, it is not. Have you ever held any other type of certi certification in terms of a state license or anything like that? Uh, no, I have not. You alluded to this, but I was <coughs> do you currently own or operate any fishing vessels? Yes, I do. Um, and what type of fishery? Uh, one here is a Dungeness craft fishing vessel and another vessel in San Diego online for tuna. <coughs> and the one here, you, you run it out of the Newport area? Yes. Mr. Funderburg, um, I would now like to discuss uh, your association with the Mary B2. The Mary B2, previously called the Best Chef, was owned by you, correct? Correct. How long did you own the vessel for? Uh, two years, I believe. Was it purchased for a specific type of fishery? Uh, yes, to fish Dungeness crab. And that's how I was employed for the duration of your ownership? 
Yes, and previous to my ownership has long history of a craft fishing vessel. All that time out of the Newport area? Uh, the Oregon Coast area, several ports. <clears throat> Did you have a chart plotter on board with an automatic identification system or AIS tied to the plotter? Uh, no. no chart problem. plotter, yes. No AIS. Just to clarify, eventually you, set, you sold the vessel. During the sale, the vessel did not have a chart plotter that had AIS. Correct. Did you have insurance on the vessel, sir? Yes. Okay. Is that a requirement for the type of fishery that you would do? Uh, I believe it is. We always carry it. Do you recall with um, which company you had the vessel insured? Uh, yes, John McKnight's insurance company, local insurance broker. <clears throat> so turning now to your operation of the vessel while under your ownership, about how many times did you cross the Yukuina Bay Bar as the operator of the best check? I would have to say probably close to, I don't know, 70, 80 times while I owned the vessel. Now, over the period you owned the best check, do you think the vessel has sufficient power for the challenges of winter bar conditions at the Yukuina Bay entrance bar? Yes, under normal conditions for crossing the bar, yes. Power accordingly. While operating the vessel under adverse weather conditions, as you approach the jetties, what speed would you want to be making as you're operating? It's a hard question to answer. It would depend on the conditions. They vary greatly when you're crossing the bar under adverse conditions. Can you expand on that in terms of that variability? Uh, <clears throat> When you're coming in under large swell conditions, you're timing the waves and series of sets. And so at times you may slack off to almost an idle two knots or something waiting and jogging around. And then when you have a chance to go, you would go pretty much as fast as you usually can in between those series. And at that point, the vessel could do around seven, seven and a half knots. Sir, the best jet had concrete ballast. Can you briefly explain why and how this affects the um, vessel stability? Because uh, it's a common practice in the older wood vessels. It puts more weight down low, lowers your center of gravity. And that impacts stability in what way, sir? Uh, it increases the stability. along those same lines. Um, can you describe what it was like to operate that vessel in terms of stability and maneuverability of the vessel? Uh, it was a, a good sea boat, yeah. Um, it was very stable, so and it's has a long, <clears throat> long history of crab fishing and fishing fairly aggressively for a vessel of its size. And a good history of coming and going across conditions fit for that vessel. Um, I always felt very secure running the vessel. Thank you, sir. Could you please describe in general terms the type of maintenance that the vessel required to remain operationally ready while you owned it? Uh, we've always performed all the general maintenance required on machinery and on the vessel itself. We would do annual all-outs, inspect it for any damage or 
bad spots or anything in the vessel, repair is needed, you know, new paint, check the shafts and propeller, all that on an annual basis. The uh, best check while you own it, the Mary Two, was a wood haul fishing vessel built in the late 50s. Did you ever experience any leaks? Uh, at times it could seep a small amount of water, you know, as a wood boat will as they dry up until they get used and swell up again from the water. So, but not an excessive amount. So you mentioned that an excessive amount. Can, can you elaborate on the frequency then, just to paint a picture? Wood boats typically leak a small amount, you know. I, I couldn't put it in exact gallons per hour or anything, but there's a small amount and they standard, you know, you have an automatic build pump to pump that out as small leakage occurs. And you said that's typical of yes. this type of vessel? In my experience, yes. And in your experience, what sort of preventive maintenance uh, did you have to undergo to manage those leaks? Uh, during your yearly haul outs and inspections, you check all the packing that's in between the wood and stuff and make sure it's all in good shape. And if any isn't, it's leaking around there excessively, you pull it and repair it. And During those those pullouts, um, did you ever complete a, a inspection that included the internal components, looking specifically for rot or decay? Yes. Lieutenant Woods, I would like to display exhibit Coast Guard Exhibit zero zero three, uh, specifically page two of it. Mr. Funderburg, I'm going to turn your attention to this exhibit. It's a um, it's a second page of a Jaquina Bay Bar uh, safety handout. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about it. I may need to point to it. Is there any possible way we can zoom into the area of the room? Mr. Funderburg, are you familiar with buoy three? Yes, I am. Do you uh, would you would you be able to locate it in, in this image? Do you need to point to it? Uh, yeah, I can see that where it is. Using your laser pointer, would you mind pointing at, at the screen right behind me? It's, it's the red button on that. Uh, Buoy three, number three, was not on station during the uh, 2019 Dungeness Crab season. In your opinion, does not having buoy three on station affect the safe navigation as a vessel prepares to enter the bar? Uh, yes, it is very advantageous to have it on location. It helps you pinpoint your position relative to the bar as you get closer. So anything else regarding buoy three? No. Sir, are you familiar with the shallower water area in front of the Embarcadero in the Newport Harbor? Yes, I am. Um, can you talk about what your concerns would be uh, if you suddenly grounded the vessel in the area of uh, that area of Newport Harbor, given the age of the vessel and the wood haul construction? Uh, would, you would be concerned and want to expect for any new excessive leaks or change in the shape of the wood in the hull afterwards, I would think. You said you would want to inspect? Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Would you pull it out? Uh, would probably inspect from inter internally. You can access most of the hull 
internally and monitor for any water leaks or anything that are happening at that point. And if you see anything of that nature, you would call out, in my opinion and experience. Thank you, sir. Um, do you think, can you talk about any possible damage to propellers or the rudders that such an incident would cause? Would depend on the nature of the grounding. Hard to speculate. Okay. <coughs> I'll follow up by asking, could it affect or um, possibly damage? Potentially, yes. Lieutenant Woods, would you please display Coast Guard Exhibit 005, page 1. If we could possibly zoom into that top area. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Funderburg, there will be testimony that two of the crew called a commercial diver on the accident day to arrange for a dive because uh, the crew said that they had a line, either the propeller or the rudder. While you owned the vessel, did you ever experience a line in the propeller? Uh, yes. It's common amongst crab fishing boats. And how did it affect the vessel operation in terms of its maneuverability and propulsion? Uh, in my experience with it, it did not affect it any. It was a small amount of line. You know, we always cut it out because it can damage other things, of course, as soon as we return to port. Mm -hmm. but Myself, I never had one that disabled the vessel, but it is possible. It depends on the amount of line that you wrap up on the propeller. In your experience, would you attempt to come into Yukuna Bay Bar with deterioration, deteriorating bar conditions under either daylight or darkness with a potential line in the running gear? Not if I felt it pampered the ability of the vessel in any way. In that situation, can you talk about what your concerns would be? <clears throat> uh, maneuverability or loss of speed. Or loss of propulsion altogether. During winter conditions, um, like the Mary B. 2 encountered, on the day of the accident. Do you give any consideration to keeping the water and fuel tanks full to reduce the effects of sloshing, which is also called the free surface um, effect? Oh, yes, we do. In, anytime we go to sea. In that vessel, we, as a general rule, kept the fuel tanks pressed and full at all times, because that's also ballast and increases your stability. And the crab tank we would have lowered at half full, which is your more stable position with it if there was very adverse conditions and not have the tank completely full. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask a question specifically regarding Dungeness crab fishing uh, in your experience. If a vessel such as the Mary Lee is returning to port on the third day of pulling pots, would the vessel have crab pots on deck or only cash in the holes? Yes, only cash on board would be more common at that time of year. And just for information, what would be the maximum number of crab pots that you put on a vessel such as the Mary B2? Uh, that vessel with the crab tank in during fishing operations, we would max out at about 40 pots if we were comfortable moving. Does that, would that change if weather forecast included strong winds? Or? Oh yes, we, we do not, if there's very adverse weather conditions, we do not tend to put pots on deck. On average, how much does a crab pot weigh? And if there's a range, 
Um, would you please elaborate? Uh, on average, 130 pounds, but as the crab pots get older, some of the metal can deteriorate and they can get down to as low as 70 pounds. Um, one second, Lieutenant Woods, would, my, would you mind zooming out on that exhibit? Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Funderburg, can you describe the equipment associated with the outriggers um, on each side of the vessel? And if you need to use the <coughs> pointer, um, you can do that. And how is this equipment used? Uh, the outriggers that are on the vessel in the picture are not used for crab fishing. They are used in uh, the salmon fisheries and the albacore tuna fisheries. Um, we would not, personally, we never have them on the vessel during crab season. We would take them off to increase the stability of the vessel. They create more weight up higher. So for Dungeness crabs specifically, the purpose is? Uh, there's no purpose for Dungeness crab fishing. Sir, Coast Guard witnesses state that one of the outriggers on the Mary B-2 was deployed as the vessel prepared to cross the bar 14 to 16 foot seas. Further testimony will indicate that one of the stabilization devices, sometimes called the bird, was out of the water. Is that typical? Uh, yes, that's when we normally take them off. It's problematic to run the stability, the birds, during crab season because there's lots of pots and gear in the water and it's easy to foul them. So, um, but it's not uncommon for some guys to attempt to run their stability birds and you know during crab season some guys do attempt to run okay. and so to be clear as a vessel is preparing to enter the bar with one outrigger out or deployed that would be typical not on my vessels I, I have seen it before but Personally, we never operated that way. Can I ask why? Uh, like I said, I usually remove the outriggers <coughs> for dungeon nest crab fishing. In your experience, what is the normal best practice on outrigger position uh, during transit into the bar? And if that's just not to have them at all? Best is not to have them at all or to have them out. You decrease stability when they are up in the rigging. It raises the center of gravity. To clarify, both at the same time, you mean? Yes. Oh, sir, I would like now to shift focus um, to your eventual sale of the best jet. Um, can you talk about your decision to sell it? Uh, we had made the decision to upgrade into a larger vessel. When did you list it for sale? Do you remember? Uh, last summer. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, so who eventually purchased the best check from you? Um, Steve Bernacki approached me and arrange the, for me to sell the vessel to him and his mother. I would now ask Lieutenant Woods to please display Coast Guard Exhibit 002. Hi, Mr. Funderburg, this is the purchase agreement um, for the sale of that vessel. I'm going to turn your attention to that purchase agreement once we have it up. Um, I'll give you time to review it and we can scroll through it as you need, just let me know. <clears throat> can you describe in, in very general terms how the best check was sold in terms of what it included? 
Uh, it was sold as an operating crab vessel. So it was sold with all the gear included to do that fishery. So and any gear included to send the fish were out in Port Troll also. So did that include any permits? It did. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, yes, it included a Dungeness crab permit. I would now like to turn to page three <coughs> of that exhibit. So um, on page three, we see that Miss Mary Anderson was the buyer. Did she mention to you what the vessel would be used for? Uh, I met with her at one time in San Diego and uh, yeah, I mean, the conversations I had with her and Steve were that it would be used for fishing Dutchness crab out of Newport. That was their intention as far as I was, as far as I knew. And I think you already said it, but just to be clear, as you understood it, who would be the operator of the vessel? Uh, Steve Bernanke. Was any work done in terms of repair or maintenance uh, before the sale, specifically for the sale and preparation for it? Uh, not specifically for the sale, but we were doing routine maintenance in case the vessel didn't sell, we would continue to fish it while it was for sale. So yes, it was actually in the shipyard at Toledo, at the port of Toledo, when they purchased the vessel. Lieutenant Woods, I would like you to display Coast Guard Exhibit 022, please. Mr. Funderburg, this is the uh, Port of Toledo Boatyard invoice. It's dated 17 October 19. Um, it includes two pages. We can scroll if you need to just let us know. Um, turning your attention to that invoice. Does that document capture the work that you were doing at the shipyard that you mentioned? Uh, yes, it does. Can you briefly and in general terms provide just an overview of what that work entailed? Uh, yes, we had had a catastrophic failure of a generator on board the power plant for electrical. And so we were replacing that with a brand new unit. And everything associated with it we replaced at the time all piping through holes fuel cooler for it all that stuff and then we did routine maintenance while we were out so we did a small amount of woodwork we found a couple things that we wanted addressed and so we had the local ship right there address them and then we returned the vessel to the water thank you sir mr funderburn shifting focus now on in the time frame of the sale specifically. Um, being a, a fishing vessel owner and operator in this community, um, during your interactions with the new vessel operator, Mr. Bernacki, during that time frame of the sale, was there anything that to you seemed unusual about uh, his behavior or that stood out to you? Uh, noticed some erratic behavior at times, definitely. And uh, I sensed a lack of experience and respect for local West Coast conditions in my talking with him during selling the boat to him. Can you elaborate on that, what you noted as not respect, like you mentioned? Uh, while we were going through the boat, I could, like I said, I sensed he didn't understand the local bars and the crossings, and so it concerned me at the time. So I tried, attempted to talk to him and give him some local experience and knowledge, but he seemed unresponsive to accepting the information. Sir, to that point, from your conversations with Mr. Bernanke, do you know how long he had been in the Newport area? Uh, very recently. In 
it seemed to me he had probably never fished out of Newport or maybe come and gone a very small amount out of this area. Can you talk about what you told the new operator about the vessel's characteristics and handling? Uh, I don't know that we went over anything specific. You know, I explained to him how I had normally fished the boat and in what manner, what things I did to increase the stability or manage the stability of the vessel as far as keeping the fuel tanks full and not filling the tank of very, very rough conditions and, and stuff. So just the normal showing him the boat and my experiences with the boat and how we handle the operation of it. Did you take Mr. Bernanke on a test ride on the vessel or demonstrate the operational capabilities in that way? Um, I personally did not. My nephew was running the vessel at the time for me. Um, he had been capping it for about a year. And so he took Mr. Bernanke on a test ride down the river, helped deliver the boat back to Newport and show him all the operating systems. When you say down the river, <coughs> from Toledo to Newport. Not offshore then? No, they did not go to sea. During your com conversations about the capabilities of the vessel, did you discuss entrance uh, to the Jacquina Bay bar? Um, I attempted to, and that's some of the stuff that he was, he wasn't that interested in talking about it, put it that way. Can you elaborate on how so? What made you feel like he wasn't interested? Uh, he basically just told me he knows what he's doing and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't receptive to input or talking about it. He just over and over, sure he knows what he's doing. He's very experienced. In the interest of not making any assumptions, of, it, did he ask you questions about how to operate the vessel in and out of the... No, he did not. Uh, sir, my final topic, and I appreciate your patience. Were you operating your vessel on January 8th? of 2019? Uh, I was not. I had a captain that works for me on the vessel that particular day. On the vessel that you own? The one that I currently own, yes. Um, sir, what size, age, and horsepower is that vessel? My new vessel? It is, was constructed in 1997. It is a 54-foot steel vessel. <clears throat> Can you, so you weren't operating that vessel? No, I was not. Um, do you recall when that vessel departed port that day? My vessel? Mm -hmm. uh, my vessel had already been at sea on that particular day and had come in to offload and escape the weather. We knew there was very adverse conditions coming that were gonna come up fast and be very rough. So we had come into port sea shelter. Do you remember around what time you came into port? Uh, I believe it was early afternoon. We were actually towed in by the Coast Guard. We had a steering failure that day, just offshore in the crab fishing grounds. And we elected to be towed in because we were concerned about the weather coming up and coming up fast and the conditions the bar would be in. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned the weather. How do you typically check for the, to understand those parameters? Uh, we follow several weather apps on our phones, and we also have the weather that's on the VHF and on the internet. We, we obtain weather from pretty much as many sources as we can to get the best idea of what the conditions are going to be that time of year. If you recall, what did you understand the conditions to be later that night? Uh, they were going to be 
extremely adverse with pretty much as far as I know, the majority, if not all, of the fleet was coming to town to seek shelter on that particular day. As a vessel operator and owner, how often do you rely on weather forecasts? Uh, constantly. Do you trust them? And with that I mean, in your experience, how reliable are weather forecasts in this area? Uh, as a general rule, they're very reliable that time of year, and we try to put our trust in them, but we also err on the side of caution. So, thinking back on the Mary B2 now, uh, on the best chat while you owned it, would you have ever crossed the bar as the operator of that vessel and under similar nighttime conditions, crossing conditions, um, as was experienced that night? Um, I was not there at the time, do not know the exact conditions. I know I would not have been at sea that particular day on that vessel to be in that position myself during the time period I owned that vessel. You mean on that vessel specifically? Yes. Why is that? Uh, the size of the vessel, and and like I said, for the most part, any vessel, our vessel's much larger and a better sea keeping vessel that we have now, just due to its size and design. And we had come in because of the weather coming during crab season. We, like I said, we try to err on the side of safety with the weather. So you know, a big bar can be very dangerous. Thank you, sir. Um, have you ever, in, in keeping with the theme of, of the weather um, conditions, have you ever requested a bar report from the Coast Guard? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, it's not uncommon for many people to fish out of here to request bar reports from the Coast Guard during that time of the year. The Coast Guard's extremely proactive in the Dungeness crab fishery early on and the safety of the local fishermen. So we tend to work very closely with them during that time of the year. So it's, like I said, not uncommon to call for bar reports or even seek an escort during extreme conditions if you get stuck in a bad spot. Have you ever received a Coast Guard escort? Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, we've had them come out and conditions if we were concerned and usually the Coast Guard's more proactive and concerned than we are. They'll usually volunteer and escort during those conditions and it can be several scenarios but most common is they'll have a vessel waiting just inside of you and another one escorting alongside or just behind you helping call the conditions and guide you in safely. As an experienced vessel operator in this port, do you have any ideas on improving the safety of crossings at the Jaquina Bay Bar? No. In your opinion, sir, is there ever a time when the Coast Guard's closing of the Jaquina Bay Bar should apply to all vessels going out or in, including commercial vessels? Uh. It's not my decision to make. <laughs> I mean, there's times I choose not to cross it. We make our own decisions. Do you have an opinion on it? Uh, no, not really. Mr. Funderburg, is there anything that you would like to tell us that I might not have asked you um, about this tragedy or about how to prevent similar accidents from happening in the future? Mm, nothing I can think of. Mr. Funderburg, thank you so much for your testimony today. I have no further questions, uh, Commander Dinn. Thank you. Uh, I'll now ask members of the uh, panel if they have additional questions. Ms. Foster?
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have two follow-up questions. Uh, the first is relating directly to um, something you had stated earlier. You said that the best chat when you owned it did not have AIS. Uh, do any of the other vessels that you currently own have AIS? Uh, yes, one does. Is it the one operating down south or the one operating here locally? The one operating down south. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yes, we're in heavy, heavy ship traffic in the ports we go in and out of with that vessel. Is that primarily the reason it's not used here? Or you haven't uh, used it here? Yes, we're not required to use it here and there's not a lot of ship traffic or anything. It's mostly commercial fishing vessel traffic. Thank you, sir. And uh, one last question. We talked quite a bit about the conditions that night and you had made allusion to the vessel, the best chat when you owned it, um, could handle normal conditions and you said um, it was a good sea vessel for the, the conditions that it could handle. What, what max uh, wind or sea state would you be comfortable taking the best chat out in? Uh, you know, sea states can change a lot by currents and different things, but as a general rule, if it was blowing more than 25 and more than a 10 foot sea, we would probably not go fishing with that vessel. You know, it's just the size of the vessel. It was a, a very stable, good sea going boat vessel, but all boats have their limitations. Thank you, sir. No further questions, ma'am. Thank you, I do have a few questions for you. Um, you mentioned that when we were talking about the best chat and when it was at the port of Toledo, mm -hmm. that there were some some issues you wanted to address. Yes. Um, and that you have this address. Could you expand on this a little bit? Uh, we had damaged a, um, a rub rail, which is a sacrificial piece of wood on the side of the boat that's used for bumping into docks or pilings, protects the whole <laughs> And we had had um, some damage to a rear section of that, about six foot of it, I believe, somewhere around there. And uh, so we had the shipyard replace that, and we had them just inspect the vessel for any other bad spots they might find at the time. Um, was there a generator replacement, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, was. there was, yes. Um, and could you explain why that generator was replaced? Um, it had had a mechanical failure, catastrophic mechanical failure to it, so we elected to replace the whole generator and all the associated stuff with it at the time. Was it a replacement in kind as in um, to make sure that there was no added weight? Was it the same model? Yes, yes. It was very, very similar. Maybe not the exact same model, but a very similar size and power of generator and weight. So, after the generator replacement, um, which happened in, in 2018, mm -hmm. you uh, you believe that the weight of the vessel and the configuration of the vessel, right? So it wouldn't have changed its center of gravity. No, not not. Yeah, I don't believe anything we did would have changed any any amount of the ballast or stability of the vessel. Okay, thank you. Um, when the test ride happened with your nephew, uh, do you recall about what time of year that was? Like what month? Uh, it would have been late October or early November. I'm not sure of a specific date at this time. So, um, jumping topics a little, but I held my questions to the end. Um, the day that your vessel was towed in, um, meeting January 8th, do you remember about what time that was during the day? Uh, it was midday that we were towed in because we were concerned on getting in before the tide changes and the weather was to come up. So I like noonish or yeah, two. Or? Yeah, I believe it was around noon or one, somewhere right in that area. 
So as the owner of that vessel and not being on board, what did communications look like with like with you and your vessel? On top? Uh, the captain called me, told me what was happening, that we had lost steering, and we had merely blown a steering line. And he attempted to repair it quick once. He made some headway. It was failing again. And so we did not trust to attempt to cross the bar with steering that could potentially have a failure during the bar crossing. So we decided that our best course of action would be just to call the Coast Guard and receive a tow in. So you were actively engaged, even though you weren't on the vessel, you were actively engaged in making that decision to have the Coast Guard engage and, and do it. Yes. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Does any other, uh, go ahead, Mr. Woods. <clears throat> Mr. Funderburg, if you were being escorted across the Aquina Bay Bar by Coast Guard vessels and you had an obstruction in the propeller or rudder, is that something you would want those Coast Guard boats to know about? Most definitely. No further questions. Thank you for your testimony and for answering these questions. Just a second. <laughs> we have one more piece. And it's Mr. Riley, do you have any questions for the witness? Thank you. Can you hear me? based on your experience with the best check of 25 knot winds, 10 foot seas, is sort of the outer limit of how you would uh, cross the bar as far as weather conditions? Uh, and that's that's a hard call. Like I said, currents and a lot of things can, there's a lot that affects the actual sea state condition. But as a general rule, if we were watching the weather and it looked like it was gonna be 10 foot or bigger and 25 knots or more, we would probably not go out, we would maybe go look at it and take a look at things, but that was towards the upper end of our operating conditions. Do you remember specifically mentioning those uh, those numbers to uh, either Mr. Bernanke or uh, Mrs. Anderson? No. With respect to the Coast Guard Exhibit 3, which was a safety pamphlet that was displayed early in your testimony, have you ever seen that document before? Yes, I have. And where, where would you have seen that? Can you pull that up, please? Uh, it's passed around and it's hanging at, say, the boat launches around the harbor. and It's posted in places. With respect to the hull of the best jet, besides the um, propeller shaft. Um, what other through hole openings were there on that hull? Uh, there was a through hole to feed the crab circulation pump, a two inch line to circulate water to keep crab alive. And and then there was the main engine was raw water cooled so there would be a through hole to cool the main engine which was also used as a deck hose as far as i can remember that would be the two through holes when you're in the engine room would you have an ability to visually inspect those um those potential openings or the connection to valve yes yes they were easily accessible and had emergency valves to close them how about with the uh, propeller shaft was was there there a space from which you could visually see the uh, the seal the condition of the seals from the inside uh no you cannot while the crab insert tank is in the vessel you had mentioned some experience or some knowledge of the type of um, problems a line in the screws could cause um could a line in the screws cause damage to a the propeller shaft or the seals 
um, potentially as if there was a large amount where it walked up the shaft. It could get bound in there and, and cause some problems with the seals? Yes. With respect to the pilot house, uh, was the helm located amidship? Uh, no, the helm was forward and to the starboard side of the wheelhouse. Okay, so it's on the starboard side. Uh, um, there's a there's a door in the aft part of the, the superstructure. Is it that far to the starboard side? Uh, yes, it's on the starboard side of the house, which is common for crab fishing vessels. Because the person at the wheel has got to be able to look aft to see what's going on on deck? Correct. Was it a traditional wheel helm or uh, was it a stick? Uh, there was either or. You could, there was a, uh, a jog lever or a traditional wheel. And the operator could <coughs> select either one? Correct. Is there an autopilot function? Uh, yes. If the autopilot was engaged and the operator was manually operating the steering wheel, the, the helm. Um, how would that impact the autopilot? Uh, at that point, the autopilot's usually in standby mode, and then you can use your helm, your wheel helm. Does the autopilot um, operate in the background if the operator's um, actively uh, providing commands to the helm? Uh, no, not if you're using the manual helm. It overrides anything for the autopilot. Okay, it kind of turns off ways to be activated again? Uh, yeah, it's in standby mode. Was the charting computer, was that on the port side of the pilot house? Uh, yes, it was. When I sold the vessel, I'm not sure of the configuration after that understand that was something that you had installed and that's the position that you would put in yes um, what type of radios were on board the vessel when um, you sold it um vhf and yeah deck hailer and stuff yeah where was the vhf radio located uh with respect to the helm position uh within easy access to it within hand arms reach was it in the ceiling or on the uh, it was on the ceiling. Council. Ceiling. Okay. Left hand, right hand? Uh, left hand. Thank you, Commander. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Thank you. We do have some uh, follow-up questions. Lieutenant Guy. Yes. Um, <coughs> Mr. Thunberg, um, so you just mentioned that you did not mention the limitations of the vessel in terms of the sea capabilities um, to Mr. Bernanke when you sold it. Um, given your previous testimony, I just want to clarify and ask you, um, did you attempt to? Um, yes, like I said, I attempted to talk to him about local conditions and stuff because I was concerned about it after talking to him a little bit during the cell vote that he may not have the knowledge or respect of the equipment of bar. But as I said, he was not very receptive or interested in having those conversations. But he just assured me he knew what he was doing and had many years of experience. I have two more questions. <clears throat> On January 8th, 2019, if the vessel you owned hadn't had all the steering and you hadn't had to be towed out, or towed back in rather, <laughs> what was your order and your uh, operator's plan with respect to timing of coming back in? 
Um, we had intended to be in on that midday tide. I believe there's, I don't remember exactly, but there was a tide midday that day, and we had intended to be inside by that time before the evening time when the weather was supposed to come up. Okay, so that was a, like a purposeful decision for yes. planning. Yes, we were concerned about the conditions coming that evening. Do you know if after the purchase of the best shed and its conversion to the Mary B2, um, if AIS was installed? Uh, I, yeah, I have no knowledge of that. Do you recall if Captain Bernacki mentioned that or any plans to install AIS? Uh, not that I can remember. Okay, thank you. Mr. Allen? While you're up here, since you're so experienced and, and you mentioned the, um, <clears throat> the impact of the current conditions on the decision to, to enter, um, can you explain sort of generally, and then there may be some follow-ups, what are the preferable current conditions if you're on the outside and you're trying to time an entrance into the uh, Uh A slack tie is preferable. Any tidal movement. Um, what's the window on either side of slack for the? You want to start at the beginning of slack or just before slack? Yes, early on, so you have time to adjust if necessary. Yeah. Between um, flood and ebb, is there a prefer preference? Uh, <clears throat> between those two. <coughs> Yeah, flood if you have to, and this your worst conditions. So when you were considering um, with your vessel out there on the morning of uh, January 8th, having some steering issues, uh, you were probably thinking about the, the particular current conditions and what was going to be the optimal return? Correct. So the ultimately when the vessel was towed across, it was probably somewhere around slack? Um, I, I'm not sure of that, what the conditions were when they were towed across because our timing had changed due to the steering malfunction that we experienced. Okay. Was it already on its way in at the time of the steering malfunction? Uh, yes. Or it already left the, the grounds and um, had fit, concluded fishing? Yes, they were transiting. The plan had been to come in on that tide. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commander. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thunderberg, for your testimony. Um, you are now released as a witness at this formal hearing. Thank you for your testimony and cooperation. If I later determine that this board needs additional information from you, uh, I will contact you through your counsel if you get one, or we'll reach out through Lieutenant Woods, uh, who is our investigation reporter. If you have any questions about this investigation, you may contact uh, Lieutenant Woods. Thank you. We'll go ahead and take a uh, five-minute recess. The time is 9.17. Five-minute recess. We'll start back at 9.20. If, if anybody needs to use the restroom, uh, right out that door, go to the lift. And then right around the corner. It's like everybody's had too much coffee. I'm guessing you're Dan Hardy.
Mr. Shum. Sir, please state and then spell your full name. Robert Jones, S-C-H-O-N-E-S. Please state your current employment and position. I'm a local marine surveyor um, in the Newport area here. Please state any education or training related to your profession. I'll go with a background history. I basically grew up in a fishing family. Started fishing when I was eight years old. Bought my first commercial fishing vessel when I, in my early 20s. Fished out of the Newport area here for 20 plus years in the local fisheries. Up and down the west coast, in and out of most all the ports on the coast with the exception. extensive experience in crossing the Equinibay Bar. I think I said I fished out of here for 20 plus years. Educational background as far as certifications, uh, no. I sold my last commercial fishing vessel in 2000 and was approached by Mr. Tom Curry who was the uh, local surveyor at the time. I was his associate for five years and approximately five years ago I took over his business. And please state if you have any professional licenses or certificates related to your profession. No, I don't. I am not NAMS or SAMS accredited. At this time, um, I will begin my primary line of question. <clears throat> Mr. Jones, all of my questions are related to the time frame prior to the loss of the crew and the fishing vessel Mary B2. If you'd like to take a break, please let us know. Mm -hmm. We will explore these broad topic areas, general duties of a marine surveyor, interaction with the Mary B2 or the vessel crew before the accident date, interaction with the vessel owner and the Mary B2 post-accident. And Mr. Schoen, just for the record, when you were talking just now about your the 20 plus years of fishing, was that, was that primarily commercial fishing? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Mr. Schoen, can you tell us about the work you did involving the fishing vessel Mary B2 or Best Chet prior to January 8th, 2019? Um, as a, as a surveyor, one of the things you're tasked to do is the insurance company, if the vessel has hull and machinery insurance. In the case of the Mary B2, as uh, Mr. Thunderbird touched on, they had an equipment failure. That equipment failure is covered by insurance, assuming it's not caused by normal wear and tear. In this case, they had the generator failure, the engine lost oil pressure, seized up, and this basically happened when they were taking the boat to the Toledo boat yard to be hauled out. So I, I, I attended the vessel. It was indeed a covered claim. We took the old generator out. We replaced it with a brand new one of like kind. The only difference being is the tiers of pollution <coughs> standards is the older engine was a tier two. By law, you'd have to upgrade to a tier three. There's no difference in size, very little difference in weight, maybe only, maybe even less with newer alloys and stuff. Oh, I, I, I think the question that you guys were touch, trying to touch on was, was it a effect in stability and stuff? No, in my opinion, none. The engine was removed, it was reinstalled. The new engine was purchased, installed by Toledo Boat Yard. It's my job as a marine surveyor to see that 
the vessel owner is made whole again, no better, no worse, with like kind equipment, and that it's properly installed. And I'm not a, a doctor by any means. It's my job to oversee the project. Mr. Schultz, do you remember the date of this? Uh, I do have my report on that claim. That loss took place on, I mean, the initial failure took place on August 25th, and I attended the vessel on August 30th, once again on September 14th after installation, and several times in between. I'm in and out of the boat yard quite a bit, and I always check, you know, the progress of repairs. So the, the work of that project concluded on September 14th? Um, that I don't have the date on. I submitted, I usually don't submit mine reports to the insurance underwriters until after all the invoices and stuff are in so I can put together a complete package. Uh, that took place on 11-9. I don't know. 8 30th to 9 14, two weeks. I would say it was awfully close at that point. I mean, of course, they've got to purchase a generator. It's got to be shipped. The ship, the boatyard's got to install it. There was some other... Uh, things that had to be installed at the same time. This newer generator required a larger Q cooler, which was ordered, paid for, installed by the shipyard. I do have pictures of the vessel out of the water at that time. Um, to answer your question, I would say yes, on or about September 15th. Is, it could vary either way, a few, a few days there, but I'm not, I'm not sure. The uh, best indicator that might be the invoice, the shipyard invoice, when that was billed. That was billed on October 17th, so that's quite a bit later. I don't have the date when the actual installation was complete. Understood, sir. Just to talk a little bit more about the general duties as a marine surveyor, would you say that the scope of your work is limited to the affected equipment? Yes. Well, yes. Um, yes, you, I mean, they had a generator failure. Your, it can not only go be the affected equipment, but what needs to be removed to physically make access to install, take out the old generator and, and replace it. In, in this case, these generators are relatively very small. It came right out through the hatch without any major removal of other vessel components. And sir, what was your overall opinion of the vessel's condition? I hadn't been involved with this vessel before. I had, I had seen it from the distance. Uh, I've never been aboard it. The, uh, the vessel, I was actually impressed with, with the vessel. I mean, it was in much better shape than I had. Uh, what do I want to say? Viewing the vessel from the distance, and I'd seen it over a number of years, and you know, it wasn't a really a, a cosmetically pleasing vessel. So you would think that, you know, it's a backyard built by a boat or something like that. But once I got aboard it, I was actually impressed. I didn't go through the whole vessel. I was mostly limited to the engine spaces, but I did notice the cabin and the interior, and they were quite nice. I mean, the vessel was nicely maintained. Although, like I said, I did not do a survey on it, and I did not do a complete vessel. Mm -hmm. 
How does a marine insurance company make sure that a vessel is insurable? Well, that's the other uh, flip side of your, your duties. That every three to five years, sell a request and survey, and and potentially even an out of the water survey. So, as a surveyor, you 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 attend the vessel. You look at the overall condition. You're looking at the hull. Uh, in the case of a wooden vessel, you're looking at rot decay. When was the vessel last refastened? Uh, you get into listing the equipment, the electronics, steering, all the different components of the vessel. The overall condition of the vessel, the wiring, the plumbing, the through holes. Um, as a marine surveyor, you're basically the go-between between the vessel owner and underwriters to, they're asking your opinion, is this vessel a good risk? So we will point out any efficiencies that pop up. Uh, emphasis, of course, is on safety. Not only do we look at what the Coast Guard looks at for their dockside inspection, we look further than that. Uh, is is the vessel functioning properly and in a emergency situation is everything in place. Most vessel owners go over and above what minimum Coast Guard requirements in the way of fire extinguishers, they'll have excess, you know, more than is there. Personal recovery devices. You can't have enough safety items. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Shones, I'm now going to display Coast Guard Exhibit 005 Marine Survey Report for the Best Chet Report of Survey 2016. We're displaying Coast Guard Exhibit 005, and I might add that you did not conduct this survey, and we are using this to illustrate a survey report. Is this similar to the reports you fill out as part of your surveys? Similar, yes. Um, basically, covering all the same components. Uh, the survey was done by Alec Nam, Associated Marine Surveyors. He's a highly respected surveyor on the Oregon coast here. He is now. And it's probably approaching 80 years old. He is retired, but he has been doing surveys for a number of years that are accepted by all the major underwriters, and he's very, very good. There was some previous testimony about the vessel needing caulking, as it is wood construction, and some caulking may have been done. Were you aware of that caulking? I was not, and as Clint stated, Wooden boats, you know, just the nature of how they're built. They work in sea conditions. They're caulked with a lot of them with caulk and stuff. And they will develop seeps. Of course, in summertime weather, they'll dry out. And when the first rains comes, the decks will leak. They'll swell up. Everything will tighten back up. Uh, it's not unusual at all. To that's just regular routine maintenance. <clears throat> At any point, did you ever inter interact with Mr. Bernanke or either of the crew members in such a way as to be able to comment on Mr. Bernanke's experience with bar conditions in Yaquina Bay or similar bars on the Oregon coast? No, I didn't know uh, Stephen or the other two crew members personally. I, I had no interactions with him. <clears throat> It appears that the Mary B-2 had a 32-inch 
five bladed propeller and an ending horsepower of about 160. Is that typical for a vessel similar to the Mary V2 operating around the offshore waters here in the Newport area? Uh, give me just a minute. 471. Yeah, um, for, for, for that size of vessel, that, that would be pretty typical. Um, wasn't underpowered by any means. Mr. Schultz, would you like to make any comments on your on your visits to the vessel that we may not have asked about? Uh, before or after the casualty? Before, sir. Well, the, you know, like I said, I wasn't there in the capacity to totally survey the vessel and, and, and inspect it. But like I said before, um, the vessel appeared to be in very good overall condition, you know, just glancing at it. Uh, I didn't see any deficiencies. Looking at the outer water pictures, the, the bottom looks tight. It, I mean, it, there's there's no reason to suspect uh, hull failure. Of course, you can never predict an engine failure and stuff like that. Nothing jumped out at me that was that I said, you know, that would have came to mind where I would have said to myself, that needs to be addressed. I would like to shift your attention to after the accident on the night of January 8th. Please talk about how you learned of the, the incident. I was actually informed of the incident shortly after daylight hours on the morning of the 9th. I have a f very close friend that works with the fire department and he called me before daylight and said, hey, do you realize we have a vessel on the beach? And I said, no, I hadn't been alerted to that. Typically, what happens in that kind of situation is the insurance agency will call me and you will be assigned a case. In this case, I was alerted early. I typically just show up to see if there's any assistance you can provide. I've done it on several vessels over the years, just, just because, to see what you can do to help. When you arrived at the beach, who was picking up the miscellaneous parts of the vessel? The park service had already, I probably got there by 8, 8.30 in the morning. By the time I got there, the park service was already uh, undertaking a beach cleanup and actually had quite a few personnel on the beach along with a couple of uh, four-wheel drive ATVs collecting debris, um, just doing a beach cleanup. I did drive down to the wreckage and uh, by, you know, by then the tide was changing, there really wasn't access to it. So the, basically the tide forced us off the beach. The park service, I've got some pictures, I think I gave them to you, they had already picked up some debris including the life raft and had they had a staging area set up at uh, night beach turnaround. The first day the debris was just stacked on a sidewalk. The second day they had actually <coughs> obtained 20 foot dumpsters and had put that debris in there and I have pictures of the debris that they had placed in there and uh, that stuff was eventually delivered to the landfill. I'm now going to display Coast Guard Exhibit 004, which is a map showing the area to the north entrance of the Coin Bay.
was looking at Coast Guard Exhibit 004, which is a chart of the area north of the entrance to Kona Bay Harbor. Can you use the laser pointer and point to the location you're referring to where the vessel washed up? And please use this monitor to my left. The vessel would have washed up just north of the North Jetty on the sand spit, right there. But the debris was scattered. Bin boards, hatch covers, small amount of debris was um, scattered all the way to Euclid Head. I'm now going to display Coast Guard Exhibit 059. Did you collect any items for the vessel owner? I did. I had talked to Mary Anderson, the mother. She was living in San Diego. She had family members coming from the East Coast, stuff like that. I assumed they were flying. I said, look, I will try to get you some meadows off the boat. I was able to recover the compass, a clock, and uh, a VHF radio. Now that said, the Park Service returned the survival suits, the fire department returned one life jacket, and the uh, local Coast Guard gave me the vessel keeper, all of which I returned to the mother. Were you ever asked to recover any parts of the vessel, such as the engine, the propeller, or the rudder? What you see in the pictures there, it, it appeared to me the vessel snapped in half, and then the forward half sheared off at the deck line. There was no engines, no drivetrain, no fuel tanks. Um, Basically, what you see in that picture right there is what was there, and that deck is attached to, I mean, the, that wheelhouse is attached to the forward deck, and that's all that came ashore. Sir, as a marine surveyor, do you have a, an opinion as to why the pilot house remains somewhat intact, but the whole of the vessel was destroyed? The... The forward deck, I can't recall how far it came back, was aluminum plated. That may have held it together. I don't know if that aluminum deck came back to the half side of the wheelhouse or not. Clint might be able to expand on that. Um, personally, given the sea conditions, I didn't expect to find a wheelhouse there the next day. I figured it would break up and be scattered on the beach, and it surprised me that it stayed together as well as it did, being a wooden fiberglass CD um, wheelhouse, you know, subject to breakers twice a day. I'm now going to display Coast Guard Exhibit 040, which is a photo of an emergency position indicating radio beacon or EPER, which was from the Mary B2. Looking at Coast Guard Exhibit 040, can you tell if that is the EPIR you recovered and anything to add about whether this was a new or older piece of gear? This is a 406 megahertz EPIR. I can't get 
I believe it's a category two means that it has to be manually deployed. I don't think it was the category one, which automatically deploys. This is a newer model, and it was in working condition. In fact, when the Coast Guard gave it to me, I took it home, put it on my garage bench, and my wife was having trouble with her battery in her car, and if I hooked up the battery charger on her car, that inverter would go off. I manually had to disable it to stop that, and I did not want to return it to the family um, and have similar circumstances and not know how to deal with it. So what I did is unscrewed the battery, cut a plastic washer and put it in there as an insulator so the battery could not make contacts and gave it to her. When you looked at the survival gear, which was the survival suits, the emergency position indicating radio beacons and life raft, can you speak to the condition and overall quality of that equipment? It was it was industry standard equipment. I did not take that close a look at uh, life raft. The emergency suits were either of an imperial brand or similar. They're industry standard and they appear to be you know, given that they went through a wreckage to be in serviceable condition. I don't. They were inspected by the Coast Guard afterwards, you know, visually. They weren't in, you know, tested for leaks or anything. I would expect that, you know, the survival suits, which I assume were not being, well, which weren't being worn at the time and were probably in bags, I'm not sure, could have been readily accessible, you know, to survive a wreckage like that, I would assume there could be some pinholes and stuff. But all the zippers worked. I actually took them home, dried them out, washed them out <coughs> before returning them to the owners. Can you speak to the size of the chain and anchor as to the quality? Uh, that's interesting because the anchor winch itself, it, uh, it had a, I don't want to say, a free spool valve on it where the anchor could be deployed, meaning that it didn't require hydraulic power. The, in the anchor was deployed, I think it was deployed in the capsizing, <laughs> that anchor, winch, and chain were more than adequate for a vessel that size. And very good condition. We actually wanted to save the anchor winch but, and the chain and stuff, but the tide was getting us during the removal of the wreckage and uh, we weren't able to. And sir, do you think that the <coughs> anchor could have been deployed on its own due to the capsizing or would it have to, would it be required to be manually deployed? This one had a free spool system on it where it, it more than likely deployed it during the capsizing. I can't imagine anybody going up to the bow to operate the anchor winch while crossing the bar. That would be not a good decision. I'm now going to display slide two of ten. Excuse me, slide nine. <clears throat> the exposure suits, sometimes called survival suits, were recovered. Do you know if any of the victims were found wearing any of the vessel's exposure suits? No, they, I understand they weren't. And typically in a questionable bar crossing situation, they're cumbersome. Um, 
the Coast Guard will, you know, will request that you will put on sort of, uh, life jackets, which they did. This particular life jacket here was returned to me by the fire department, and this would be the life jacket that they took off the captain when they removed him from the vessel the following morning. I understand there were, that other two crew members were wearing life jackets. It's, I don't know that for a fact. They were not returned from me, and I don't know their whereabouts. <coughs> Mr. Jones, we've asked a lot of questions. Is there anything you would like to add that has a direct bearing on this investigation? Actually, I made, I made some notes from uh, Clint's uh, question there. Uh, our conditions at the time, 12 to 14 foot with occasional 16 foot breaks. These are very questionable conditions to be crossing a bar. Personally, and I've made hundreds of bar crossings, when, when you get over 10 feet, that's where you start paying attention. And 12 to 14 foot with occasional 16 foot breaks, these are the kind of conditions you want to approach only at high water during daylight hours. Now, said that, the, the question came up, would you cross the bar under these conditions? Well, yes and no. If you're out in the ocean and you have these conditions and they're forecast to deteriorate, as in maybe you've got 20 knot winds with big swells, maybe it's forecast with gale warnings are coming to 60, 80, 100 mile an hour winds, you're going to do your very best to cross that bar, even though there's not optimum conditions. Uh, the call now autopilot. That autopilot has a stand, an off setting, a standby setting, an automatic setting. If that autopilot is in an automatic setting, your manual controls are basically not usable. The, <coughs> the autopilot will override any manual input, except on the autopilot keyboard itself. So, it was always a policy on the vessels that I drove. We never came across the bar on autopilot. We always manually steered because we can correct the course faster than the autopilot could. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what approach he made. I was, even though you have an established buoy line and channel, in my experience, crossing this bar, if you have a large westerly swell, you can actually make your approach from the north side of the buoy line, which puts the swell more on your stern instead of quartering it, so you're not, you know, swell passes under it and you approach, you have a lot better steering capacity. When this first happened, seeing where the accident happened, I assumed that he came and that he came approaching from the north side. Of course I didn't know whether he was fishing north of town or south of town. He did make a, an approach from the south, which is it's the preferred direction to come in. You have the ranges to work with. Uh, under this circumstances here, the Coast Guard policy that I've seen in this section of the coast anyway, anytime you have questionable conditions, you do not have to request an escort. They are automatically there. They will escort vessels across the bar as a matter of policy. You don't have to request it. The Coast Guard here is first class, very good. And we appreciate it. I've crossed that bar a number of times. And even though sometimes the Coast Guard's an inconvenience, <clears throat> you're glad they're there. <laughs> uh, rope in the wheel. More often than not, crab vessels on this section of the coast get some rope in the wheel. Usually, 
it typically will not disable the vessel. But if you get that rope in the wheel tight enough, it could cause the engine to die, it could cause the shaft to snap. I've seen times when the rope is in the wheel so tight that it causes a lot of pull on the shaft itself and you could have a reduction to your failure. Um, I guess that's a judgment call of whether or not you're going to cross the bar with the rope in your wheel. If it's a vibration and it's not affecting forward motion of the vessel or your steering, then yeah. I mean, the local diver here would swim the docks and cut the rope out of the wheel without even asking, throw it on your deck and send you a bill. That was fine. Almost every trip you had rope in the wheel. It's just part of doing business. Uh, ocean conditions. I don't know how long this vessel was at sea, what the ocean conditions <coughs> were when he left, nor what the forecast was. Seeing that most of the vessels were already re returning and I understand he was getting bait, getting ready to leave is a bad judgment call. But I, like I said, I don't know how long he was out, if he was only out for a number of hours, if he spent a day or so at sea, those things I don't know. I think you asked me, if, well, I'll, I'll just let you ask some questions. <coughs> Mr. Schultz, at this time I have no further questions unless you have something else that you would like to add. Not really. My, my, my involvement with the Mary View was, you know, very limited. I mean, there wasn't a lot of wreckage. There was no pollution. There was, um, you know, basically, I, I was tasked with uh, removing the vessel from the beach, and, you know, for insurance purposes. I also helped the mother get the remaining crab gear that was in the ocean to the beach. Uh, Still, you know, facilitated the family in whichever way I could, given the situation, knowing that they were, what had happened, and uh, you know, had been from out of town, helped them as much as much as I could. At this time, would any members of the board have any additional questions? I have some additional questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier in your testimony that you collected some items from the vessel. Yes. And you mentioned that you took a VHF radio yes. uh, to give to the vessel owner. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose the VHF radio? It was, when I went into the wheelhouse, it was full of sand, it was accessible, it was a small item that if they had uh, travel by airplane or something, it would be something that would be something they could put on a shelf or in their living room or something for a memory. Um, there wasn't any real reason other than, it, you know, the compass was small, the clock was easily accessible, the VH radio, I just unscrewed it, disconnected the wires. In hindsight, I probably should have not given that to them right away. The Coast Guard actually said they had a forensic team that could have looked at that radio and maybe determined if it was on the correct channel, if it had been on or off at the time of the um, casualty. The radio went up, and, and, and there was two VHFs hanging there, and it was just the easiest one that was accessible. The wheelhouse was full of sand. You had to basically crawl into it. Do you recall uh, what the setting was for the volume knob or the power knob? Was it on or off, volume up or down? No, I, I can't even remember if they had knobs or they were push button. It was a newer DSC style VHF uh, with a liquid crystal display screen which was completely full of water. There was no indication that it was just dead. Okay. So 
you've mentioned that you have quite a bit of commercial fishing vessel experience. I do. As well. um, in your operating experience, have you ever crossed the bar, the Quinn Bay Bar, in con environmental conditions that were similar to the night of January 8, 2019? Absolutely, or worse. And of course, I'm on a large vessel, 65 to 90 feet. Um, what are, so what are the things that you're considering when you determine whether to cross that bar or not? What are some of the variables that you consider? Well, you will actually approach the bar and stop well offshore and time the periods. <coughs> uh, once you make a commitment to go, you try not to stop. You go as fast as possible. You have a, a person standing at the back door looking out, calling out sets. You know, here comes a big one. Hey, this one's going to break. If you get in that situation and you're going to break, your forward momentum actually works against you because you will start to surf on that wave and potentially approach. You will slow the vessel down and sometimes even put it in reverse and stop your forward momentum until that wave or two or three waves pass you and then you're good to go again. Uh, the crap fleet operates in these weather windows. There's always boats coming and going and typically they will put out the results of their bar crossing, especially if they had problems. They'll say, hey, Given the bar conditions, the, their actual crossing experiences. You know, the bar was good, the bar was bad, we had no problems. Um, or their opinion of, hey, I wouldn't cross that thing, no way. There's times when there's three or four rows of breakers there, 20 foot breakers, three or four rows deep. It would be absolute suicide <coughs> attempt to cross that. You just wait. Before, if you've got deteriorating weather conditions and you're, you know it's going to do nothing but get worse, then now is your best chance. But you want to do that on a flood tide as close to high water as you can, preferably during daylight hours. You don't always have those choices, but that would be optimal. So if you had, in your experience, if you've had the experience of having a line in the wheel, you said that you might still cross the bar. Um, yes, if, it, if, if, if it's not causing any problems, typically, well, depending on how much line it is, it, it could reduce your propeller flow and stuff. But it's you know that's happening because they're you know the boat's just adversely vibrating, and you know you know that you've got a problem. I mean, so is that something that? Um, in your experience in that situation that you would communicate if there were Coast Guard assets out? I would think that would be relevant, yes, if you were looking at potentially uh, rest restricted or uh, less maneuverability, especially if it was entangled in a rudder and to, to affect your steering capabilities. So a little bit broader question, what, what other things would you as an experienced commercial fisherman what other things would you communicate to Coast Guard assets that were underway and there to escort you? Uh, well, you're, you're obviously going to uh, tell them how many people you have on board. Um, you, uh, wouldn't be a whole lot of communication there. I mean, you know, obviously if you're under uh, distress or the vessel's under distress of some sort, you would want to communicate <coughs> that with them. You're going to tell them, like I said, how many people are on board. Um, it's really not a lot to communicate there. I would be more concerned about making preparations for the vessel across the bar, tying down anything that's loose, making sure all your hatches are shut, getting rid of any rope or anything, tie-up lines and stuff, stuff that could wash over or potentially foul your propeller, those kind of things. I would be more interested in preparation versus, you know, uh, making preparations to cross the bar. Uh, we never cross the bar any 
time with crew members in their busks. That was policy aboard our vessel. Everybody is awake. If we have an accident, we don't want somebody getting out of their bunk. So along, along those lines, mm -hmm. um, what are best practices when crossing the bar with respect to um, vessel crew and their positions? You, you mentioned not in a bunk, where would they be? No, I mean, I mean that was just policy aboard, aboard my vessel. Nobody right. is in sleeping or in a bunk. You are up, awake, dressed. If you're going to cross the bar in adverse conditions, you, you post a lookout. Like I said, out the back door, the skipper, the skipper you assume is facing forward. He can't see what's coming. If you're swinging, you're broaching from side to side as the waves come under you. You're headed every which direction but straight. So you will post somebody at the back door and call out those sets to you. As a commercial fishing vessel, uh, as a commercial fisherman, did you did you have your crew stay on deck, or were they in the pilot house? No, they were inside. They might we might have the back door open. There might be a guy standing there if. There was not a window to look out. He could stand at the back door, um, you know, and then shut it if <clears throat> need be. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bowser. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Follow-on question about the autopilot mm -hmm. for the benefit of the public and some who may not be familiar with that piece of equipment. Um, is it possible to determine by looking at it whether it was an auto or manual? That particular autopilot had a rotary switch on it. Um, boy, I wonder. I don't think I got any pictures of that, but that would be a very good question because that would be something, you know, if wave action didn't move it or debris floating around. It should have been, in, if he was manually steering, it should have been in the standby mode. Yes, which, so you don't which, happen to recall whether... No, but, I, but I've got, I took a lot of photographs. I, you know, I was asked if I took photographs of electronics. Uh, I don't think I have a picture of that autopilot. But that is a common, now 1001, it is a very common pilot used in the industry. I don't believe I have a picture of that, and I did not pay attention to where that rotary switch was placed. In regards to the lookout, you mentioned um, their position, looking out, calling out those waves mm -hmm. for the benefit of the operator. Mm -hmm. Is that happening while you're crossing the bar? Also, in a situation where you're having the Coast Guard escort you? Yes. Yes. The, 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 you want the, the Coast Guard is also talking to you, saying, you know, they're, but they're quite a ways behind you in most cases. 100 yards, maybe even 200 yards. I'm not sure where they're at in this position. But at nighttime, with a limited just visibility and stuff. You want somebody standing there looking behind you saying, this one looks okay, oh, this one's getting bigger. You know, this one's likely to break. You know, or along that line, you want first-hand information. Where the Coast Guard is further behind the vessel, they can give you an update that those waves are coming, but you don't know how they're going to respond when they get into the shallower water, especially around, around the jetties. I don't know what the tide was doing at the time he made his crossing. If it was ebbing, those swells can stand up quite a bit steeper. I'm, I mean, I just assume that you're going to want to make this crossing as close to high water as you can, or maybe even a little bit of flood. But not on him. That's that's a not proven seamanship. Thank you, sir. Commander, do I have time for one more follow up? You do, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Schultz, 
In your opinion, is there ever a time when the Coast Guard's closing of the Yukuna Bay Bar should apply to all vessels going out or in, including commercial vessels? Uh, yes, I've, I've, I've been in that situation. Of course, it's on a larger boat. We were in Crescent City trying to get home. Stayed there for probably 10 days trying to get in between storms. We finally left. We had a 26-hour journey. When we got to the bar, the Coast Guard closed. And rightly so. We crossed the next morning, but we jogged around out there in a hundred knot wind and ended up crossing the next morning. There's no way I would have crossed that bar. They didn't have to close it. I had already made the decision I had I ain't crossing that day. So yes, there is times when they close the bar where it needs to be closed, but if they close the bar and the weather deteriorates even further, given the vessel size, which is the worst? Do you attempt to cross the bar and reach safe haven, or do you stay out in the ocean for maybe two, three days and take a beating and maybe not survive that? So it's a judgment call. Which is, as a captain, which is the best <coughs> at the given time, given the circumstances. But there is definitely a time when the bar needs to close. Thank you, sir. And hopefully it's when everybody's in the harbor. Mr. Jones, I do have uh, one more question. I'd like to, to circle back to um, your role in assisting with the salvage mm -hmm. of the remains of the Mary B2. Were you ever directed uh, to take any action by the vessel owner or uh, a representative of the vessel owner to seek, seek out or, or identify or locate the remains of the wreckage of the Mary B2. Because you mentioned that you know, no, no engines, no drivetrain, no fuel tanks were ever found. So were you ever directed to do so? No. And I, to this day, don't know where that wreckage settled. I, mean, I expect over I expected over time that a little bit, you know, as the hull continued to break apart, the pieces would continue to come up ashore. Uh, haven't heard of any. The vessel actually appeared to be snapped in half and then sheared off, and then the forward part of the deck was sheared off. I don't I don't know where the rest of the vessel ended up. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Ryan? <clears throat> For clarity's sake, is it fair to say you were hired by the hull insurer, not the vessel owner? Yes, the hull, yes, I was, I was, uh, the insurance company. Okay, and your instructions were from the hull insurer, not the vessel owner? Correct. You used the term safe haven, and just with respect to what's shown up there, which looks like Coast Guard Exhibit 4, you can tell us at what point when a vessel is crossing the bar has it reached safe haven? How far inside the jaws does it have to get before it's out of the, the hazardous area? Well, well before buoy seven where it turns there, you would be considered safe. I, well, if you were to look at that, the link to the jetties there, you can still be in trouble in a southwesterly swell a third of the way inside the jaws. Mr. Riley, Mr. Schultz, um, I think that uh, exhibit, Coast Guard Exhibit 003, page two, might be helpful as far as what's been defined as like the, the right area. So let's go ahead and pull that up, please. Please continue as soon as we put this up. I apologize for interrupting, but I figured this would be a little bit more helpful. Yeah, that's helpful. Is the um, sort of the the safer area um, visible on this exhibit? I would say I believe that's a, a B up there. If you could get to that B point in any given sea sea conditions, you would be safe. 
and maybe even, in my opinion, half that distance between the jetty tips and stuff. At the times that we harvest stuff, it can be a real wash for it. fact, the first 200 yards inside the buoy. And in that southwest sea condition that's coming straight down the jetties, and the jetties aren't uh, giving you any protection, then it would, could be even further. But in my experience, you're pretty safe once you get a couple hundred yards inside. You had testified about um, staying outside the, the hazardous zone and sort of observing the sequence of, of swells. And in this case, there will be some testimony and there's a specific exhibit that um, has a, a sort of a lengthy discussion um, by the on-scene Coast Guard um, teams about a, a sequence of what they called a lull, a small set, and then a big set. And they observed this over a period of time. Is, is that the sort of sequence that, that you would have been observing back when you were uh, operating vessels across the um, jetty? It, exactly. You want to the, cross the bar. Yes. I mean, typically you're going to have a large series comes through and you'll have that lull. You need to know what that lull is to see if you can make it from point A to point B in that time frame. I don't know what the lull was here. And that was my follow-up question. Does the, the sort of the sequence and the timing vary greatly? Um, I mean, is it is it specific to that day and that time? Yeah, at the, not only yes, I mean, even, even closer than that, but I mean, typically, 14 to 16 foot breaks, there might be a five minute low, a two minute low, maybe a 10 minute low. So you will approach the bar as close as safely as possible. And when the series go by, your guy at the back door says, that, hey, it looks good, you go full throttle. <clears throat> you don't want to spend any more time on that bar than you have to. With the exception of if you missed your timing, now here comes a big set. You want to slow down, let those waves pass you by. You don't want to surf down. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. With respect to um, the period of time in a particular lull, um, if you're out there and you observe a lull of, say, five or six minutes, how confident should you be as a vessel operator that the next lull is going to be of similar duration? Generally, they won't, they won't change fast, but they can increase or decrease as the storm front offshore moves further away. The wave height will come down, the wave period will spread out. Um, degree of confidence. You hope you call her right. That's all I can say. I mean, crossing this bar is no joke. It needs to be respected, especially in such in these conditions. These conditions here, very dangerous, especially in nighttime hours. In my opinion, as the local, uh, as one of the local surveyors, from time to time, you would be involved with. Um, assessing damage that may have occurred during a bar crossing on fishing vessels? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, both uh, crossing in and crossing out. Um, this particular crab season, season open, the price was settled. The fleet decided to go in less than optimum conditions. It's crossable for the bigger vessels, but even then they were they blew out windows, had issues. They bad judgment call on their point, but uh, there's a saying: you may not be the first one to leave the harbor, but you won't be third. So once it starts, it's a rat race. There's people crossing the bar in vessels that should probably not be crossing the bar because of the pressure from industry and to get your crab gear in the water. 
follow up on your mention of broken of broken uh, windows. Um, how's a a similar windows in the pilot house? Yes. How does a, a pilot house window get broken during our conditions? Well, uh, typically it'd be on departure where you're going into the waves. Um, it's typically nighttime, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, particular vessel that lost its windows that night was 70 foot class wheelhouses well off the water safety glass windows in aluminum frames sea conditions weren't such that you would have expected to lose your windows but it was just he went over one and under the other and a green water just slammed him and blew the windows out so there was another vessel that lost some windows on January 7th or 8th? Yeah, I don't know. No, I think it would have, I think it would have been earlier. I don't know. When, whenever the gear setting period came. I'm going to turn to the, your testimony about the VHF radio. Did you dismount the, the radio? In other words, you had to turn some screws to take that, uh, dislodge that? Yes, the typical knobs. It was still mounted in its holder to the seat right where Clint explained it to be within easy reach of the helm chair. Were the radio handsets in their stored or dislodged position, if you recall? I think they were still in their holders. <coughs> Did it uh, Mr. Woods, can we turn to exhibit seven, page two? go in there. I wanted to follow up on the, um, <clears throat> the issue of licenses and, and credentials for commercial fishermen. Um, given your experience and knowledge about the local fishery, um, do you have any idea how many of the um, local masters and crews um, have merchant mariner credentials of any kind? Be very few. That is one of the questions we ask when we survey a vessel is the experience of a owner or master, whoever's driving the vessel, and, and if they do indeed have uh, merchant marine certification of any level. Uh, most of them do not. Most of them have uh, you know, the required first aid training, the safety training. You know. Most of the vessel owners here are very well experienced with years and years. Of course, there is a newer incoming younger generation that typically follows uh, family tradition that would have started out as crew members that are very <coughs> But yeah, to, to, to answer your question, I would say it's less than probably two to five percent carry, say, a hundred ton master certificate or something along that line. Okay, and there are, there are credentials that are less onerous to obtain than the 100 ton. You know, just there's deckhands and ordinary seeming credentials, things like that. Right, yeah. Very, very, very rarely do, do I find crew members with that. In fact, we don't even ask that question. It would be more long than find the questioning towards the owner operator or operator of the vessel. With respect to um, your observations post casualty while the superstructure was on the beach. Do you remember any broken windows in the um, um, the Mary B2 um, the, superstructure? The Mary B2, when I when I first attended it, the forward part of the wheelhouse had Lexan windows. They were intact. As time went by, I did notice those windows wave action and crack them, but they were they were there. They hadn't. They did work blown well out. They were cracked, but they were still in, in place. All right, so we're looking at page two of exhibit seven up there. And there's a cracked window on the left hand side, and your recollection is that occurred after beaching? That was, well, after beaching, yes. That was, um, <coughs> no, I, did, I did take note that the windows were intact when I initially attended the vessel. Uh, there's a, uh, can you turn to page four? There's a window on the starboard aft portion of the um, 
superstructure mm -hmm. that appears to be missing. Do you have a recollection of that being intact or missing upon your first inspection? That one I can't recall. Looks like those might be <coughs> possibly rubber framed windows. I don't, I don't, I can't see if they're in a aluminum frame or not. What you have on the side of the wheelhouse here is a Lexan window, which is bolted in. It doesn't, I don't see those bolt holes up top, so I can't recall if that window was there or not. Can you give us an estimate of the, the distance internal in the, in the um, superstructure between the helm position and that open door that's on the aft part of the superstructure? Eight feet, possibly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commander. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, for the benefit of the public, the, the vessel that you were referring to, that, that was a marine casualty case as well earlier, but it was not that night. It was uh, the night before. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I was also assigned that case. I would have a look at the date. Um, so you're referring to the Patriot. Yeah, so that would have been on the 7th. Yes, sir. Okay. Also, I Sorry, go ahead. Can I follow up? You may. Were, were the conditions, do you know what the conditions were on the evening of the 7th? Were they worse or better? I don't know for sure. I mean, obviously, if you're pulling the windows out of a 70-foot boat, sea conditions aren't very good. And there was quite a few boats had exited the harbor prior to the Patriot. No problems. The Patriot just got caught in the wrong spot at the wrong time. It's an experienced master of the Patriot? Very, but, and it, it was surprising to see what it did. I mean, it's not like you take a break and it's white water. White water has lost most of its energy.
you know, like, I'm gonna run that. Like, Damn, you know, like, that's what it is. And then it's like, fine, I'm gonna run that speed. And then again, I, I'm like, nope, nope, nope. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do that. No, we were supposed to have the garden. Yeah. 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 So we just started moving, 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 moving. Then we finally grew the bike for a bit, and then see the crab larvae, and then and so we moved. So we just figured they were eating, you know. A couple of weeks ago, um, we were out on the sea rock and black. Well, it's super cool. Yeah, yeah. They were challenging. Oh, we left the dock at seven. With three people on board, so it wasn't, it wasn't, and we ran to start off with them. So it's like, you know, the fishing was pretty good, but for us, I mean, we get a little spoiled. Yeah, you know, she's done. So, we're Chief up. Commander Fu. Oh, I guess Thursday might be a good day. Like, um, I got a piece of paper.